Butler, who's a Knox adjunct faculty member and uh, pastor of Florida Coast Church, here to give that response. As we explore these lines of inquiry, we do so with confidence and knowledge, knowing that God is consistent in who he is and he's consistent in the way that he has revealed himself, both in terms of general revelation, the world around us, and special revelation in terms of scripture. And yet, there's a tendency to divide the two. There's a tendency on the one hand to have science claim authority over the world of the phenomena around us, the ability to explain that in ways that don't require theological concerns at all. And on the other hand, there's, there's this tendency for theologians to claim that we don't really need to engage meaningfully in conversations about the world around us because we have God's special revelation to us in scripture and that's sufficient, that's all we need. And that's a scary thing because what we're doing is we are divorcing the world in which God has created and said, this is mine. And the heavens and the earth declare his majesty and we somehow retreat into potentially just looking at his special revelation through his word. And I'll speak personally, that was a hallmark of my own upbringing. I've been educated in Christian schools my entire life, for the most part. And even having gone to a Christian college and a Christian seminary, I am remarkably ill-equipped to engage meaningfully in conversations about how my faith and getting matters and engages well in the world of science. That is not okay. And we at Knox recognize that's not okay. This is one of a series of first steps towards addressing this important avenue of bringing back together an understanding of who God is in light of the multiple ways, the two major ways in which he has chosen to reveal himself. And so, I'm as excited as you are for me to stop talking and get this show on the road because I'm here to learn along with you. And so with that, I'd like to invite my friend and colleague, Dr. Tim Sansbury, up to begin these series of talks. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you for that welcome. I understand we still have some audio issues on the live stream, so if I'm looking back, are we all the way up on, that's great. So for the students that are coming in from a distance, we want to welcome you as well now that you can finally hear us, hopefully you're still here, um, as well as everyone that's come out this morning. Uh, for those at a distance, we understand that um, uh, this is part of what you're trying to do for school, and so we are uh, glad to be able to have it up for you and ready to go. So as we get started, I, I, I'm going to be on the stage a few times, which you'll be able to determine whether that excites you or not here in a few minutes. Two of those talks are the responses and the kind of really fun looking forward stuff. Uh, this one is a little bit different than that. This one is more designed to give us some categories, some categories of thinking. Now, if you've ever paid attention to academics when they make up categories, the first person to really come out with a set gets a lot of credit, and then a lot of other people get published by telling them all the, way that, all the ways that they're wrong. And that will be true of what I'm going through right now. So I'm going to be talking through, generally speaking, some categories of how science and religion meet that come from a fellow named Ian Barber. And Ian Barber was one of the first people to really set this out at a popular level. He influenced a lot of people, even though theologically, when you get to what he likes the best, uh, most evangelicals, and all of them that are paying attention would be troubled by what he ends up with. But his categories are still helpful. They're helpful for us today because we go through them. I want you to pay attention to them as they, as they come out in ways that they may fit the way you think on a day-to-day -day basis, the way you expect things to go in this science and theology or science and Christianity conversation, but also the ways in which it um, almost makes you think in a particular way and keeps you from being able to engage well either on the science or on the side of religion. So the categories, one of the critiques is they mix things together and they're, you're going to see that, I'll try to bring it out, but they're helpful to see as a starting point. Now, I'll be doing them out of order, so if you're familiar with his book, you won't hear them the way that they go because I like a different one the best than he does and this is my talk, not his. Um, the first one that I want to talk about today is a model that he calls independence. Now, independence is, in, in, at the basic level, independence is the idea that 
theology or religion talks about a completely different kind of thing than science does. They just are having different conversations. And there's some truth to it. We could, we could see a picture of that. So imagine someone who has just had their house burned down. And they're standing in the front yard and they're saying, why did this happen? Now, if we were to come in with a good chemistry answer and start looking for heats of activization and talk about the way in which, well, you had this little bit of energy that came in on the front end and then there's wood inside of your house and so then that allowed the overall energy to drop and decline and really that wood would rather be carbon dioxide and water and that's why, no. They're not asking how it burned down. They're asking why, for what reason, to what end, for what purpose. There are ways in which science and religion answer different questions. Morality is one of those areas where ultimately, while science can be helpful in talking about morality, when the, the questions, the right questions and the right issues to ask about have been given to it, by an external, whether philosophical or religious system, on its own, science is insufficient to be the establishment of morality. But that's not enough, because when this is really taken to the extreme, what it ultimately does is it says, if I'm religious, I don't care about what science says. And if I'm scientific, I don't care about what religion says. And that was part of the, one of the initial ways in which this was brought out, that was part of the goal, was let's just stop having these fights. You do your thing, and I'll do my thing. In the church, we actually bring this up at times, not at the level of intentional theory, but we bring it up at the level of accidental way of life. In the church, we talk about people who seem to see Christianity as a Sunday thing, and have that utterly and completely separated from what happens at least Monday through Friday, if not Saturday as well. So it can be a lived way as well as an intentional and thoughtful way. But ultimately, it cannot be enough. While it's true there are some areas in which science and theology do not overlap, some areas like morality, where they can help each other but can't conflict with each other, there are also areas where very directly Christianity is making claims that enter into the scientific world. Paul, when addressing the Corinthians about the resurrection, is very clear. If the resurrection did not actually happen, then this is all worthless and a waste. And he didn't say it like some foolish, crazy, superstitious person who thought resurrections were fairly straightforward. He said it like you would expect him to say it, as someone who understood this is a crazy claim. Resurrections don't happen. It's not like in the Greek world they were used to them, so no one was surprised, but now we know better. That's why he says, go talk to this guy. Go talk to that guy. Go talk to those 500 people. Go talk to the people who saw it happen. There are points of overlap which we need to recognize, which essentially Paul was saying, and if it didn't happen, then understand this isn't true. Christianity makes claims that overlap with reality in ways that prevent us from doing this just complete separation. Independence doesn't work. Now, the next model is one that Barber calls integration. And if you read Barber, this is the one that he likes the best. The physicist John Polkinghorne gave a series of lectures when I was in my uh, seminary studies, and I was able to listen to him. And in talking through this, he said, I, I actually renamed this assimilation rather than integration. But instead, to kind of help, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a more technical term and call this the smooshing model. The smooshing model. Integration is a nice word. Assimilation is a little bit more of a, uh, gives you a little more of a rhetorical sense of what the problem is. And smooshing tells you really what's happening. It's when we just say, look, one or the other, either religion or science, gets to tell us what the truth is. And we can pull words, we can pull concepts, we can pull ideas from the other to have the scraps and leftovers or the places where they fit, but there's really only one of these. 
In my experience, thoughtfully done, this most often happens on the side of science and trying to create a, uh, whether to say a religious-y science or a science-y religion, I don't know which way to go, but it's on the side of the science basically dictating this is what the concepts of reality are and getting to lay religious names over the top of those. So what God is, is limited by what we've seen about the way the world works. Process theology, which is what Ian Barber favored, is when he gets done with it, initially, I should say, it's not a very Christian kind of theology. But Barber manages to bring a bunch of Christian words and lay them into process theology, which you don't need to know about, in a way that makes it sound much more like it's Christian than it really is when you get down to what it means. That's why Polkinghorne said what he has done is he has assimilated the religion from the side of science. Now, we can certainly do that from the side of Christianity as well. But more often, when there is the frustration with the content of science, we get into the model that's called the conflict model. The conflict model is probably one that you're most familiar with. You're probably most familiar with it because of several, as, you'll, um, as some of us that were in class heard over the last couple of days, there are several absolutely false histories of science and religion which say that's always the way it works. And they're just demonstrably false. That the ways in which theology, and Christian theology in particular, and scientific endeavors have been linked together is remarkable and complex. But the conflict model comes popularly just from this idea that that's the way it's always been. But it also comes from what we often experience. We often experience this sense of conflict. People on the science side, the reason this grant exists is because the scientific community finally was pushing the endeavor to have seminaries do a better job because they were feeling like we're constantly fighting this battle with religion and we don't want to please equip people better. Now their goals in that may not be the same as ours, but they're responding to this idea of conflict. One of the biggest problems with the conflict model is it's not actually something somebody would believe. In terms of the idea that Christianity or theology has truths in it, and science has truths in it, and that those truths are incompatible. I, I, there aren't very many people who will say those sorts of things, and actually the ones who do usually end up in the kind of independence model. If you really mean truth, it's hard to mean truth combats with truth. If you're naturally thinking in this combat model, this conflict model, it's probably because you have some expectations in mind regarding either religion or science. From the science side, likely, if you think science and religion are in conflict, likely, it's either because you're overextending what science can actually say, or in your mind, religion is really something that's in the little <coughs> narrows of ignorance that we have, or we don't yet understand the world, and that the more science grows, the more religion shrinks because of the way that, just what knowledge is. Because of seeing something like science and religion as being the same sort of thing, but now science is taking over as religion fades. Probably, from the science side, if you're starting from conflict, it's that, or it's a category of believing that religion is religious people, and by religious people, meaning a few loud voices. Now, that last one will be our hook to go into the next side. On the side of Christianity, if you feel like science and Christianity are in conflict, it is probably because you're doing something similar. You are probably either seeing science, using the word science, but meaning scientists, and by scientists, pointing to some particular representatives, especially those who claim to be representatives of the whole thing, like Richard Dawkins. And if Richard Dawkins is science, then science and religion are in conflict. So one of the ways you may feel the conflict is there is because by the word science, you mean something different than what science is. You mean scientists. It's also possible that you mean conflict because by the word science, you mean a 
a broadened worldview. Something that science does methodologically is go into the laboratory and assume that things are going to happen in regular ways. The same way, the way it happened yesterday is the way it'll happen tomorrow. And, they're, and not only regular, but by means of natural causes. This is entirely consistent with Christianity, which understands natural causes to be God's ordination for how the world will work. It's entirely consistent. Part of what makes miracles miraculous is that they're weird. They have to be weird to be miraculous, and to be weird is to say that they're extraordinary. But there are people who extend that methodological practice of naturalism into a worldview. Rather than saying, I will act as if there are no miracles or there are no supernatural events, to use a word that's not perfect, there cannot be any of those. Now, actually, one of the great skeptics in philosophical history, a guy named David Hume, who was no friend to the Christian religion, is also one of the best guys to have undermined the idea that you could possibly, by any number of appearances of the same thing happening over and over again, discover that miracles can't happen. Science cannot say that miracles can't happen. That is not a possibility within the scope of what it does. But there are people who will act as if it does, and there are times that it can feel as if it does. And that's also because as Christians at times, we can have these gaps where we say God is working there. And as science starts to explain that gap, we feel our world shrinking. And rather than relying on the, on the underlying theology of sovereignty that says, whoa, this is all God's, we feel our faith being shrunk and we react. The conflict model cannot be sustained as a real picture of how the world works. It only works as a mistake or a psychology or a sociological theory. The last model, though, is one that he names dialogue. And it's the one that really explains what we're doing here. So Barber, I said, prefers integration. What we will be doing here is dialogue. Dialogue recognizes that while it's impossible to completely separate religion and science, and while it can't possibly be that they're always in conflict if they're actually expressing truth, and while it's not enough to just smush them together, there are still things that happen that are surprising. One of the one of the things that you'll, I think, be surprised by in the next talk is going to be hearing from Galileo this rich, rich description of the authority and inspiration of Scripture. I think you'll be shocked. One of the things that will be a minor point, though, will be seeing how much he sounds like John Calvin when he does that. And I'll draw your attention to something in Calvin that's really interesting. If you go to John Calvin's commentary on Genesis, and you're going to see a little bit about it here, you're going, to, you're going to hear about it shortly, and you're going to, I'm going to reference it again in the end. Calvin references this really interesting conflict that was apparently going on in the church. And the reason it's so interesting to me is because I had never heard about it. I didn't know that it was a conflict. I've never felt this sense of, ugh, about what was happening with Scripture. I haven't even, even today, I'm not really able to touch it as a way that feels bad, and yet it's so consistent with the way apparent conflict really does happen in the church. So here's what had happened. Scripture, you may remember in Genesis 1, talks about the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars. And in that description of the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars, the stars are described as lesser lights, and the sun and the moon are described as greater lights. Now, for me, looking outside and going and viewing the sky, that fits. Saturn and the planets are smaller than the moon. Now, in my head, because I've been getting it through elementary school, it also doesn't bother me that I know that Saturn is actually quite a bit larger than the moon. It doesn't bother me a bit. But if you were to take yourself back to a time period in which it's actually surprising, I think, to find that at the time of the Reformation, astronomers had been able to show by means of some remarkable studies that they did without the kinds of tools we have today, 
that Saturn was bigger than the moon. And right away, put yourself in the position of somebody who gets told by scientists, Saturn is bigger than the moon. I find my students don't have much sympathy for the people who were upset by this. But think about it. Scripture says, lesser lights and greater lights, and the moon is a greater light. And going outside says, lesser lights and greater lights, and the moon is a greater light. And to presume that what scripture is doing there is not just describing what I see, but affirming how it is, is very natural. And frankly, if somebody walked in and said, you see that little point of light? It's actually really big. It's bigger than the earth. They knew the earth was round. They knew about how big the earth was. That's really big. Is it really true that the first thing you would think is, oh, okay, I've been reading this wrong. In the moment, that would feel like conflict. The feeling of conflict is not the problem. The question is, what do we do? And that's why what we're doing here is anticipating the future, because what we should do is let a conversation happen. And by the way, some of those conversations will take a long time. Let a conversation happen. It's the first moment you hear somebody say, that little tiny point of light, it's bigger than the moon. You say, no way. But then, if you look at it and the evidence is really strong, then what could you do but appropriately go back into Scripture and say, is this possible in that Scripture? Now, you can't even feel it now, if you're like most of my students. That you would even be worried you can't feel it. But Calvin is answering to people who are obviously angry with him and the scientists and saying, look, as you'll see, look, God was talking to people who didn't know this. He was accommodating his language to what they thought. The dialogue doesn't mean you immediately then get over it. You might feel uncomfortable your whole entire life if you've been reading it one way. But what dialogue says is that when something new comes in that you weren't expecting and you don't know how to handle it, stop and think. Go back and look. Now, maybe you would go back into scripture and you would say, I just can't change this. And you would go back over because science does not always come to us correct. It does not always come to us correctly interpreted, and it does not always come to us correct and lacking an overall worldview that isn't actually in the science. The dialogue produces time for us to try answers out. Some of those answers will be wrong, and one of the things we need to allow is a place for people to try answers without being immediately condemned when they aren't the right ones. The first answers will usually be wrong because we haven't had time to puzzle things out together, and we'll talk about that at the end as well. Dialogue is what we're aiming to do today. We're going to look at a past event in more depth. We are going to anticipate some future events on purpose because we need to get ready for the ways in which these will be a challenge. You'll see starting points from respondents who said pretty uniformly, I don't know how to do that and to whom we said, that's the point. As we prepare students, we want you to see how the process works. We want you to understand that the process isn't finished and that even people with fancy degrees getting confronted with ideas that live in their own home don't always know what to do with them. We don't know, and we also don't know exactly how it will play out, but we do know that truth does not conflict with truth, we believe this truth is true of Christianity. We believe that Christ was really resurrected, and so we engage in a process of interacting with what we learn from his world and what we read in his word, understanding that it's been 2,000 years, and it'll continue for a while as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Ted Davis is somebody that I've gotten to know through the course of this grant. We were introduced at the beginning. Ted is, uh, is coming in from Messiah, as you heard before. And Ted is gonna be talking about one of these times when conflict came up. It's probably one you've oversimplified on two sides of things. You've probably oversimplified Galileo as just a scientist, and you've probably oversimplified the objections as just Roman Catholics and Aristotle. And I hope that what you'll hear is something that is much richer 
and shockingly similar it was to me when I first saw the real text to the way that we would approach this very kind of issue today. So with that, I'd like you to welcome Ted Davis and bring him up. And uh, are we supposed to take a break right now for coffee? No. What? No. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Well, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to talk to people, real people, uh, like you folks, rather than just uh, you know, pointy-head academics like me, about kinds of things that, that matter to you, matter to me also as a historian of science, and that have a, have a lot of significance for the modern church, in my opinion. Perhaps you'll share that when I'm done. We just heard about the significance of Galileo for our conversation today. And I want to emphasize that. In my opinion, the text that Galileo wrote about interpreting the Bible in light of astronomy is the single most important text ever written about science in the Bible. And it was written 400 years ago. Today, in the field of politics, people still read Machiavelli. In, in military strategy, people still read the ancient Chinese general Sun Tzu. Even people who aren't Christians or Jews still read the Bible for moral insight. These are terrific texts. They have not lost their relevance for today. The same is true of Galileo's letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, which you can find online. So if you want to go out and look for it, just Google Galileo and Christina, and you'll find it. Um, it is, in, as I say, in my view, the single most important text ever written about science in the Bible. Now, I suspect it's, it's been a long time, uh, maybe a week or two, since you last heard a sermon against the earth moving around the sun, right? <laughs> well, if you'd been alive in Galileo's day, it might not have been as long as a week or two ago that you heard such a sermon. Um, it was a hot issue 400 years ago, and I think you'll begin to see why as I get into this. Now, the paper I'm giving for you today was actually written for nerds. It was an academic paper at a, at a, at a, a conference at the University of Minnesota. Well, say I had a series of talks at the University of Minnesota a, couple, a few years ago, celebrating the, the 400th anniversary uh, of Galileo's encounter with these issues and his letter to Christina and such. Um, and it was at the tail end of these. They wanted someone to bring that up to date. So my effort here is to bring up to date the conversation that Galileo has in his day. And he expresses his views on this in a letter he writes to a woman named Christina, who was the Dowager Duchess of Tuscany. That's a fancy, fancy title. If you've seen Downton Abbey, you, you probably know who the Dowager was, OK? She was the. Um, uh, widow of the previous owner of the abbey. And in this context, it's the same thing. The Dowager Duchess was the widow of the former ruler, the former Duke of Tuscany. That's the region in Italy around Florence. And her son was now on the throne in this context. And she and her daughter-in-law were very interested in this question of whether you could believe the earth moves around the sun without violating the Bible. That's the bottom line. So that's our context. So when did this go down? Well, it begins around the middle of the year 1615, when Galileo reluctantly pens a long letter to Christina to explain these issues to her as he sees it. About a year and a half earlier, she had confronted one of Galileo's former students, a very close friend of Galileo, a Benedictine monk by the name of Benedetto Castelli, whose picture you see up here. She was skeptical about this view that the earth moves around the sun. And she wanted to know if it was acceptable and true for a good Catholic to hold. This was a situation that Galileo could not afford to ignore. It was, you might say, an offer he can't refuse. This is, this is the woman who's in, who's, whose son is his patron. His son is paying his salary, or her son is paying his salary. So if, if he ignores this, you know, his funding might get cut off. 
This is not the kind of topic Galileo wants to talk about. And to be honest, it's not the kind of topic he's supposed to talk about. He had been a former university professor of mathematics and natural philosophy, that is, science. In that day, in the university system, those people weren't supposed to talk about interpreting the Bible, and they weren't supposed to do theology. They left that to the theological faculty. And yet people had been, who didn't like his ideas that the earth goes around the sun were using the Bible against him. They were bringing verses of the scripture into the conversation, throwing them at Galileo, and what's he going to do? Well, what do these verses look like? Well, here's some of them right here. If you, if you look at these texts, here, here exercise for you. Read these three texts in the next minute or so, and read them with the background assumption that you don't have now, the background assumption you would have had then that the Earth is the center of the universe and the sun moves around it. In the case of the second text here from Psalm 93, it's the last part of the verse that was seen as relevant to the conversation. Okay, you get the gist of that. Now here's the text that was, here's the longest such text. It's from Joshua chapter 10. It's about Joshua's long day. And notice that it's not only the case that Joshua asks the, the Lord to stand still, which happens um, in, in, uh, in, the, in, ver in the first verse there, verse 12, in the first uh, verse, the second verse, it's not what Joshua's asking, it's what the Bible then says, that the sun then did stand still, okay? And the moon stood still too. So, um, Martin Luther famously, famously made an offhand comment uh, against the idea of a moving earth um, in his, to his disciples at dinner, uh, in what's called the table talk. Lutherans all know about that. Maybe, maybe reformed people don't, but you can ask me about that afterward if you want. Where Luther famously says, you know, that this guy's basically crazy for saying the earth moves around the sun. And besides, says Luther, Joshua commanded the, the, the sun to stand still and not the earth. So, you know, the, the gut level response to this, uh, even from a very learned man like Martin Luther, who's a professor at Wittenberg University, is, well, this guy's crazy for saying the earth moves around the sun. Hardly anybody believed the earth moved around the sun in the 16th century when Copernicus suggests this. It's, it's not until after Galileo's time that people start to take this seriously. John Calvin, for example, whether or not he's heard of Copernicus, he doesn't think the earth moves around the sun either. Uh, he, he assumes geocentricity the centeredness of the earth when he interprets the Bible. Everybody does. Now, when Galileo writes his letter to this woman, Christina, the mother of his boss, he relies very heavily on a notion from St. Augustine, the notion of accommodation, the idea that the Bible is written, if you will, in the words of a modern biblical scholar, for us, but not to us, uh, that it's actually written into an ancient culture and in time when people's conceptions of nature and other things were very different. And that God kind of glosses over that, doesn't worry about correcting their erroneous notions of nature because it's not germane to salvation. That, that God kind of moves on over that and goes right to the point that does matter. That's the notion of accommodation in a brief way, if I may. So Galileo, writing about um, uh, these topics, draws on this notion that the Holy Spirit, who inspires the scripture, employed popular language and popular conceptions, which might be erroneous, in, that aren't meant to be scientifically correct when he, he talks to us in the scripture. Now, since, since about 200 years ago, since the early 19th century, Christian scientists and theologians have often used similar strategies to harmonize Genesis with geological time, with the ancient earth and in some cases also to argue for the acceptance of evolution. Their approach was increasingly accepted even by very conservative Christians starting roughly 200 years ago. It's still a common approach today. But starting in the 1960s, that approach came under fire 
with the rise of scientific creationism, or young earth creationism, in the United States and several other nations. Many creationists today believe that the universe, the earth, and living things were specially created in the space of six days, as Calvin says himself in the commentary in Genesis, no more than 10 to 12,000 years ago. They are convinced that true science supports a literal interpretation of Genesis, and they reject evolution and geology as false sciences created by sinful people who have blinded themselves to the perspicuous testimony of the creator. Now that's how, that's how they see this. So this talk summarizes what Galileo said, explains why it's still controversial, uh, why it was controversial then, rather, shows how his arguments get repackaged later to meet challenges from other areas, and shows how contemporary creationists keep Galileo out of the Garden of Eden. That's where the title of the talk comes from. So, in order to fully understand the specific claims Galileo made about the Bible and science, first, we need to understand the larger conceptual framework, the larger mental picture that um, he's using and placing in, in practice. So we're going to go all the way back to the earliest years of Christianity, since the Church Fathers, time of the Church Fathers. Since then, right down to Galileo's day, the dominant conception of the relationship between biblical knowledge or theological knowledge and other areas of knowledge, whether they're science or something else, is known as the handmaiden conception. This actually derives from the first century Jewish scholar, Philo of Alexandria, but it's very influential on Christian scholars right from the earliest years of the church. This concept might be diagrammed like this. We're here, I've deliberately put theology in capital letters in the upper box, which is bigger, and put science in small letters in the lower box, which is smaller, to convey the idea that science should be a handmaiden, a servant to theology, and should never challenge the authority of the queen. Science, theology is the queen, and science is the handmaiden. Now, according to that model, the appropriate role for science in biblical hermeneutics, in interpreting the Bible, is just to help the interpreter of scripture understand biblical references to various living things and natural phenomena. And that's still a common practice today, and in and of itself, it seems an appropriate way to go. And one of the examples commonly encountered in the early church is how to understand the second day of creation when God puts waters above the firmament and waters below the firmament. The firmament is clear in the biblical text itself. It's clear from the fourth day of creation that the firmament's roughly equivalent to the heavens, the place where the sun, moon, and stars are. Because on the fourth day of creation, God makes them and places those bodies in the firmament. And on the second day, there's a reference to the firmament with waters being separated above and below. So what the heck are these waters above the firmament? Well, here is a 16th century view of that. This illustration is from the first edition of Martin Luther's translation of the Bible into German. And this was done by this workshop of Lucas Cranach the Elder. It shows a geocentric cosmos, that is a cosmos with the earth in the center and the sun and the moon around it. There's the sun and there's the moon, the greater light and the lesser light placed in the sky, the stars also, the Garden of Eden and the earth itself in the middle, and around it, this green stuff in this colorized version of that. That green stuff is the water above the firmament. That's what it is. Um, for a long time, interpreters had taken that quite literally. I'm going to return to this when we discuss Calvin a little bit later. So that's one of the places in which Basil uses his knowledge of the science of the day to try to understand what this could mean. I won't detail that for you. That would take us down a rabbit hole that's not going to be very helpful right now. Now, um, this general scheme that you use your knowledge of the time to try to interpret what the text is meaning when it says these kinds of things is the standard pattern of the handmaiden. But in this pattern, the handmaiden doesn't ever tell the Bible, Bible interpreters 
that a particular conception could be right, and they have to rethink the whole game. That is what happens with Galileo. Galileo was willing to grant that theology might be, might be the queen of the sciences insofar as, he says, her knowledge excels in the dignity all other kinds of knowledge, and because her teachings are coming from divine revelation. But he's not willing to crown her queen if this means that theology simply can lord it over everything else and tell people who are experts in other areas how they really need to understand this. Galileo himself points out that many, many um, officials of the church from his day were trained in sciences, and that was true then. And so he says, you know, you're not going to say that the Bible more excellently reveals geometry than Archimedes. And you're not going to say that the Bible more excellently reveals astronomy than Claudius Ptolemy. And you're not going to say the Bible more excellently reveals music theory than Boethius, citing authorities used in the university at the time, ancient authorities whose books were still in use in medieval universities. In other words, the Bible wasn't intended to be an expert manual on a whole bunch of things. It was intended to be an expert manual about who we are and our relationship with God, but not a bunch of other stuff, is what Galileo is basically saying. That's his approach. It had also been the approach of people like Augustine. And Calvin will say the same thing, as you will see. So on the other hand, for Galileo, he says, um, concerning the scripture, it's just not something that we have to get into here in detail. God has given us reason, senses, and intellect to understand nature, he says. He doesn't expect us to deny what we've learned about nature from experience or necessary demonstrations. His term, necessary demonstrations, means from reason. That's what he means. So experience and reason can tell us about nature reliably, Galileo thinks. And God expects us to use these gifts he's given us to figure this stuff out. Especially when the Bible sometimes says virtually nothing about a topic. He considers how much does the Bible supposedly tell us about astronomy. Well, it makes casual references to this or that. But it doesn't really teach us how anything works. And he says reason and experience will do that. So Galileo assumed that the purpose of the Bible was religious, not scientific. He also believed that reason and experience, especially when combined with powerful mathematics, was capable of giving us a reliable reading of what he himself calls the book of nature. It's a phrase that's been used since the church fathers, the book of nature, that we can go out and read as if it were as a divinely written book. So because he believed the Bible isn't authoritative as a textbook on science, he stressed differences rather than commonalities between theology and science. And other commentators later will do both of those things. They'll, they'll look for commonalities as well. Galileo thinks ordinarily they won't come much into contact. That's not saying they conflict. It says they're kind of out of contact. He's more the independence model that was referred to in the first talk. The best example of this involves an epigram that he borrows from a Vatican cardinal who had been the, the librarian at Vatican City, Cesare Cardinal Baronio. And Galileo quotes this. This is the most quoted thing ever from Galileo, yet he himself didn't originate it. He credits it to the Vatican librarian, Cesare Baronio, whom he apparently knew. The intention of the Holy Ghost, meaning when the Bible was written, the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. That's, what Gal that's how Baronio had apparently put it. So according to Galileo, the primary purpose of the sacred writings was the service of God and the salvation of souls, he says. Matters infinitely beyond the comprehension of the common people. If God hadn't miraculously told us about these things, he thinks, we would never have learned this on our own. In other words, without divine revelation, we would never have learned about these mysteries and about our status before God. However, in order for God to communicate those things to us, and we are creatures with limited knowledge, we don't know what God knows. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're really dummies compared with God, in other words. It's necessary, in my words, it's necessary for God to dumb it down, okay? In the same way that, that you know, God has, to, God has to know the audience, and we're not God. God's not talking to himself among the Trinity. God's talking to creatures that don't know what he knows. And so God has to put it on our level. Galileo puts it like this. Here is, here is the, the 
the common conception at that time, and for, for many today still, the conception of how the Bible's inspired. This painting comes from the period. It's by Caravaggio. It's called The Inspiration of St. Matthew, and it shows an angel representing the Holy Spirit speaking to Matthew who writes stuff down, okay, uh, as the inspiration of Scripture. So, well, who's the audience? Well, the audience is us. And so we don't know all this stuff. How is it going to be worded so that we can get the message? That's the bottom line. So for Galileo, he says that it's necessary for the Holy Spirit to employ human language, which does not always mean exactly what the bare words signify. In other words, human language is a little more flexible than mathematics. It can have multiple meanings. It's very rich and can be ambiguous. We need to understand the text. We all know this. And Galileo is basically reminding us of this. He says, he doesn't think this makes the Bible erroneous at all. But it does mean that interpreters have to be aware of this when they interpret the text. They need to get it right. Because it could mean more than one thing in various places. Here's how he puts it. The Holy Bible can never speak untruth whenever its true meaning is understood. That's an immediate qualifier, right? But I think we would all agree with that. He says, the Holy Bible can never speak untruth whenever its true meaning is understood. But I believe no one will deny that sometimes it may say things which are quite different from what its bare words signify. Hence, in expounding the Bible, if one were always to confine oneself to the unadorned grammatical meaning, one might fall into error. In other words, the interpreter who doesn't think about this can make mistakes as an interpreter. He's got to be aware of this. He says, not only contradictions and propositions far from true might thus be made to appear in the Bible, but even grave heresies and follies. So here's an example he gives. It would be thus, if you did this, in other words, it would be necessary to assign to God feet, hands, and eyes, as well as corporeal human affections, such as anger, repentance, hatred, and sometimes even forgetting of things past and ignorance of those to come. You know, Galileo was a biblically learned person. He spent his boyhood in a Catholic monastery getting an education, and his father pulled him out when he was a teenager because he was really worried his son might follow through and become a monk, and his father wanted him to be a doctor. So, you know, he's not wet behind the ears here. Galileo adds that these propositions uttered by the Holy Ghost were set down in that manner by the sacred scribes, think of this, right, in order to accommodate them to the capacities of the common people. He describes the common people as rude and unlearned. Now this is evidence to someone like me that Galileo has just come out of a rock concert, but nevertheless, uh, this is what he says. Now, Galileo's appeal here to this idea of accommodation coming from Augustine must not be missed. The Bible's purpose, namely to convey the essential message of salvation and its audience, which is the ordinary person like you and me, who is rude and unlearned, okay? Especially think of the ancient world or even Galileo's day when the ordinary person really was rude and unlearned, okay? Place inevitably puts linguistic, and conceptual limitations on what the biblical text can be used to do because of that accommodation. That's the conception. He's not inventing this. He's getting this from the great Augustine and many other Roman Catholic fathers, but Calvin will say identical things, as you're about to see. Now, the book of nature, on the other hand, he thinks, was not accommodated to the understanding of the ordinary person. It, it's not part of the divinely revealed text in ordinary human language. It's, it's out there for us to study, and it's written, he thinks, in the language of mathematics. As he says elsewhere in, another, in a, one of his books, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word. And mathematics doesn't have the same limitations. Mathematics is a divine language. This is shared, many people shared this at the time. Kepler believes this. Philip Melanchthon, the great Lutheran theologian, believes this. A number of Catholic theologians of his day believe this, that mathematics is a divine language, and it's written in that way. And those who can learn mathematics can learn to read the book of nature. And that's clear in its conclusions, he thinks. It's a lot clearer than ordinary human speech, such as we have in the Bible. 
So, in the practical matter of interpreting biblical texts that pertain to nature, the book of nature and its, an, its clear interpretation takes precedence in Galileo's mind over the ambiguous multiple possible interpretations of the book of scripture. He thinks you can read this book much more clearly with mathematics and get a single meaning than reading that book, which is in real ordinary human language and much richer, but also therefore much less certain in certain places about what it might mean. That's what he thinks. The fallible interpreter who fails to acknowledge this would only force an error on the infallible Bible. The problem is with the interpreter, he thinks, not with the Bible. So when it comes to matters of nature, Galileo says, we ought to begin not from the authority of a scriptural passage, but from sense experience and necessary demonstration, meaning observations and reason with mathematics. These can give us a clear picture of the way nature works. Conclusions arrived at in that way can be used to help us interpret the Bible, since its true meaning, he says, must be concordant with demonstrated truth. That is, the Bible, since it's written by the same author, the book of nature does ultimately have to agree with the book of scripture. And so if we can get a clear reading of nature, as long as we don't restrict the meaning of the book of scripture in a way that wasn't intended to be, he thinks, then we can find that they're actually in agreement. So that's where he's coming from. Now, this didn't go down very well with Roberto Bellarmine, the Roman Catholic Cardinal, who was in charge of a Vatican committee appointed by the Pope to make a ruling on whether or not it's acceptable for Catholics to believe that the earth moves around the sun. This all came to a head at this time. So there was a formal conversation about all this. Bellarmine staked out his position in a letter he writes to a Catholic priest who had written a book arguing that the Bible was consistent with, with moving earth, that the solar system is acceptable. The Bible doesn't contradict the solar system. That's what the priest had argued. And Bellarmine replies to that priest, he says, if you want to hold, if you want to say that it's a fancy speculative idea that, 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 that helps us understand where the, where the planets might be next year or the next year, to, uh, to just pretend that the Earth is in motion and it gives you mathematics you like, well, that's okay. Bellarmine says, that's okay. That's just a mathematical hypothesis and there's no harm in it. But Bellarmine says, to hold that the sun is really in the center of the universe and that the earth really moves around it, he says, is a very dangerous thing. Likely to harm the holy faith by rendering the holy scriptures false. That's what Bellarmine says. And he says, if you look at all the commentators on the Bible who've ever lived, he basically says, they've all agreed They've all agreed that the sun is in heaven and turns around the earth with great speed and that the earth is very far from heaven and sits motionless at the center of the world. He says the church could not tolerate a contrary interpretation because it might put them on a slippery slope. Okay, let me explain. Decades earlier, in the wake of what the Roman Catholics, of course, regarded as Protestant heresy, and Protestants interpreting the Bible apart from church authority, they had ruled in something called the Council of Trent, a very important event that goes over many years. They had ruled that, the, that if there had been in the ancient Christian writers known as the church fathers, the people, the first few centuries of Christianity, if they, if those church fathers had had a unanimous agreement on how a text should be interpreted, we're stuck with it, okay? We don't have any wiggle room, provided it's a matter of faith and morals. Now that provision implies that not everything in church tradition is a matter of faith and morals. And if you could make a reasonable argument on such a matter that we were wrong about that, then you had some wiggle room. 
Okay? Galileo thinks that's where the wiggle room is. He thinks that the motion of the earth is not a matter of faith and morals, and you can look for new interpretations. Bellarmine disagrees. Bellarmine says effectively that everything in the Bible is a matter of faith on that level. I will quote him in a minute. He says, no one can say that astronomy is not a matter of faith. Since, if it isn't a matter of faith with regard to the topic, he's willing to say, well, you know, it really doesn't seem to be germane to salvation, how God arranged the parts of the universe. Okay, he's, he'll grant that. It would, it would, it's still a matter of faith with regard to the speaker. What he means is God divinely inspired those words, so they are a matter of faith. So you see where this is going, okay? Now this conversation all had to do with the moving earth, nothing to do with evolution or the age of the earth or any, or, or any real matter of faith and morals we most of us would probably say today, but that's how Bellarmine sees it. And he's a very learned cardinal who himself had taught astronomy briefly at one of the Italian universities. And he says, it would be heretical to say, he says, heretical to say that Abraham, it would be just as heretical to say that Abraham didn't have two children or Jacob 12, as you might as well say that Christ was not born of a virgin. Because both are said by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of the prophets and apostles. That's how he puts it. So what would it take? What would it take, if you're, then, if you're alive then, for Galileo, to convince Bellarmine to reinterpret biblical texts that seem to prohibit the idea that the earth goes around the sun? Well, nothing short of what Bellarmine calls a true demonstration, roughly equivalent, roughly equivalent to a valid rational proof, like in, a, like in geometry in high school, where you have these propositions and you prove things from them. Establishing a fact about nature beyond all doubt. Now significantly, Galileo chose to accept Bellarmine's point. He believed at that time that he could prove the Earth's motion beyond a reasonable doubt. He thought he could. He couldn't at the time, but he thought he could. He was also mistaken about the ability of science to ever meet such a standard. As we now realize, science doesn't give us absolute rock bottom certainty on anything. It doesn't work that way. And yet for practical purposes, we accept so many things that scientists have demonstrated as true, and we go and work with them and do a lot with that knowledge. Um, in other words, it works really well for a whole bunch of things. It looks like it is true, even though we can never be sure in a permanent sense that it's true forever. So there we are. That's where we are as modern people. That idea, I don't believe Galileo yet fully realized that, although he came to realize that, I think, in the course of this conversation went on longer. So, that's where it is. Now, Galileo thinks again that propositions about the motion of the Earth, this idea of Copernicus that you see here, are very far removed from the understanding of the masses, that is, the ordinary person, and not relevant to eternal life. So in those cases, he says, the Holy Spirit chose to conform its pronouncements, meaning the pronouncements of the writers of scripture, with, their, with the abilities of the ordinary person, even when facts are otherwise from the point of view of the thing itself. In other words, even when that's not really true, that's what Galileo is saying. He says that the church has always interpreted those texts to mean that the earth is at rest in the middle of the universe, is basically, he says, because at their time, the opinion of the Earth's motion was totally buried, and no one ever talked about it, let alone wrote about it or maintained it, because nobody believed the Earth moved, so the conversation didn't really happen. That's what he's saying. Now things have changed, he says. I then ask what one should do if necessary demonstrations, if you could prove the facts of nature were otherwise, okay? He said, this is not gonna falsify scripture, he says, rather, it's our, it, rather it would falsify, rather our view, excuse me, rather our view is that scripture corresponds very well to truths demonstrated about nature. The problem is with the interpreters. Sometimes this might cause difficulties, he says, but this would occur because of our ignorance and not because there really are or could be insuperable difficulties in reconciling scripture with demonstrated truth. 
He's placing the burden all the time on the interpreters of Scripture, not on the Bible. Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting with folks in Reformed tradition. Although Bellarmine saw Galileo's argument as a slippery slope to undermining biblical authority, in the previous century, John Calvin had already used accommodation in exactly the same manner when interpreting biblical texts touching on nature. Here's that picture again of waters above the firmament. How does Calvin approach that? Well, earlier commentators, including the great Basil of Caesarea, the greatest early commentator in the, in the, in the Greek churches, and, and Thomas Aquinas, the greatest Catholic theologian of the high Middle Ages, had believed that God put either liquid water or ice above the stars. Okay, that's how they understood this text. Calvin thought otherwise. Calvin says, for it appears opposed to common sense and quite incredible that there should be waters above the heaven. He says, he who would learn astronomy and other recondite arts, that is other sophisticated things, let him go elsewhere. In other words, don't look in the Bible. That's what Calvin is saying. This is Calvin. And then he says, here, the Spirit of God would teach all men without exception. In other words, the ordinary person. Same thing Galileo was arguing. And therefore, he says, Genesis, this is Calvin, Genesis is the book of the unlearned. He concluded then, Calvin concluded, that the waters here, here men, are such as the rude and unlearned may perceive. He says, the accordance that of some, the assertion of some, that they embrace by faith what they have read concerning waters above the heavens, notwithstanding their ignorance respecting them, is not in accordance with the design of Moses. So Calvin says Moses never, never intended to teach accurate astronomy here. He's speaking in a colloquial way toward common conceptions, and we shouldn't follow that. He took an identical approach, Calvin took an identical approach to the fourth day of creation, when God made two great lights, speaking of the sun and the moon as if they were the two largest bodies in all the heavens. Now astronomy was a standard part of the university curriculum in Calvin's day. And Calvin had been an undergraduate student at arguably the greatest university in Europe at the time, the University of Paris, where the standard astronomy text had been written in the 13th century, and it was still used. The great text by Sacrovasco, a monk who had taught astronomy at Paris. All the way back in the ancient world, the sizes of heavenly bodies had been estimated by the, Greek, the Egyptian astronomer Claudius Ptolemy. This is the century after Christ. Astronomers of Calvin's day knew that Saturn is a heck of a lot bigger than the moon. In fact, it's bigger than the Earth. Okay? It's bigger than, and he knew the Earth was bigger than the moon. So um, here, Calvin gives the nod to Ptolemy over the literal sense of scripture. He says this, where Moses makes two great luminaries, meaning the sun and moon, the astronomers have shown, he says, by conclusive reasons, that the star of Saturn, which on account of its great distance appears the least of all, is greater than the moon. No problem, says Calvin, since, he says, Moses wrote in a popular style, things which are without instruction, all ordinary persons endued with common sense are able to understand. But astronomers, astronomers investigate with great labor whatever the sagacity or wisdom of the human mind can comprehend. Had Moses spoken of things generally unknown, the uneducated might have pleaded in excuse that such objects were beyond their capacity. That's what he says. And he continues, and he goes on later and he says, Calvin adapts, excuse me, Moses adapts his discourse to common usage. In other words, he dumps it down. That's exactly what Galileo is saying, exactly. I can't see a difference. I can't put a razor blade between Calvin and Galileo on these issues. Now, there's actually no evidence that Galileo ever read Calvin. Indeed, it would have been dangerous for a Catholic mathematician to read anything by Calvin whose books were on the Catholic index of prohibited books, okay? But they are both reading Augustine. Calvin reads Augustine, Galileo reads Augustine, and other fathers, and this is where they get this. Okay, so this is an old way of thinking that has long thought to have had validity in Christian tradition. Now, what about the proof? 
Well, Galileo never really found the irrefutable evidence he needed to prove the Earth's motion. Uh, I'm not going to detail this for you here, but you can ask me one of the breaks if you want to tell you what this is about. But, um, modern astronomers know that there's tiny differences in the way the stars appear over the course of the year where you have to point your telescope to see them because the Earth is not always in the same place. You look at that, that, that phenomenon is called stellar parallax. Everybody was looking for it, Galileo said. So if Copernicus was right, the Earth goes around the sun, you should be able to see with the early telescopes and things they couldn't see. Nobody could see this until the 19th century, until nearly 200 years ago. Okay? In other words, the smoking gun wasn't there. We have a smoking gun today, but it wasn't there, but nobody could find it, even though everybody was looking for it. So he didn't have it. But his views do gain new relevance in the early 19th century, when geologists begin to discover deep time. The notion that the Earth has an enormously long gray human history. Now, there was initially a lot of opposition to the notion of that notion, including among Christians, since it seemed to contradict the biblical story of creation. The Earth now seemed a great deal more than just five days older than humanity. Now, even though Galileo's name was usually not directly invoked, Christian natural historians frequently and pointedly mention the Copernican controversy or use Galileo's insights to persuade fellow believers to remain open to the possibility that that might be the case. An early example is the Edinburgh natural philosopher John Playfair, who was an ordained minister in the Church of Scotland. He was commenting on ideas then current about not being able to see in the earth any evidence of a beginning or any evidence of what was going to happen to the Earth in the end. And that's a long Earth picture. Playfair defends that idea, which he does not originate. He says that the authority of the sacred books, he says, seems to be but little interested in what regards the mere antiquity of the Earth itself. Nor does it appear that their language is to be understood literally concerning the age of that body, any more than it is concerning its figure, that is, its shape, or its motion. He was referring to the Copernican idea. He says, this idea of the ancient Earth, he says, uh, is standing on the same footing with the system of Copernicus. For there's no reason to suppose that was the purpose of Revelation, to furnish a standard of geological or astronomical science. It's admitted on all hands, he says, that the scriptures are not intended to, revolve physical to resolve physical questions, as he means, questions of science, or to explain matters that are in no way related to the morality of human actions. Now, two decades later, an Aberdeen historian in Scotland, a natural historian called John Fleming, who was very strongly reformed, um, he made similar claims. He was writing in response to claims being made by a Christian geologist at Oxford, a devout Christian named William Buckland, who was no less devout than, than Fleming. Um, Buckland was the last major geologist to argue that scientific evidence supported a universal flood in biblical times. Buckland himself later changed his own mind as new evidence came in. But at that point, Buckland's arguing all the evidence we have supports a universal flood. Fleming disagreed. He said that the first principles of, he disagreed with Buckland's assumption that the first principles of geology were revealed to Moses and communicated in the book of Genesis. He added that interpreting nature can never, uh, misinterpreting nature can never be friendly Christian. That which is true in science can alone give useful support to Revelation. But undoubtedly, the most influential Scottish writer to be channeling Galileo was this guy, Hugh Miller. Some of you might have heard of him. He's well known in church history because he was the editor of something called The Witness. That was a, a newspaper for the evangelical wing of the Church of Scotland, which was later the Free Church. Okay? He's an evangelical author, challenging ecclesiastical authorities of his day to be more biblical in many ways. So Hugh Miller is not a geologist. He's a stonemason and an editor, but he knows a lot of geology, and he writes a lot about how to understand the Bible in relation to what the geologists are saying. 
His theological books present a non-literal, pictorial interpretation of the six days of Genesis. A key principle came straight from Galileo. He says, noting that the Bible had been written to an audience ignorant of science, he says, in language fitted to the ideas of that time, Miller believed that readers in his own day might still find the Bible optically true. That is, they're, they're speaking about what you would see optically true in all its details. But how differently would not a revelation have fared, at least in the earlier time, that was strictly scientific? A revelation, for instance, of the great truth demonstrated by Galileo, that the sun rests in the center of the heavens, while the apparently immovable earth sweeps with giddy velocity around it. Miller says if the Bible had taught people that, then ancient readers would find it implausible and would become unbelievers. They wouldn't believe what the Bible was saying. If it tried to teach them astronomical correct stuff, they just wouldn't believe it because it was so contrary to common sense and experience. As in the movie of your bitch, right? I mean, you're sitting here right now in South Florida going 800 miles an hour as the Earth, as the Earth spins on its axis, not on the goes around the sun. Do you believe that? I dare say you've never been that fast in your life unless you're fighting a mile or down at Cape Canaveral. Okay? You've never gone that fast in your life, but you are right now. And that's incredible, but that comes with the solar system idea. So common sense is not reliable on these things. What the ordinary person thinks is wrong about these things from, from, from your experience. That's the point Galileo was making earlier. <laughs> well, nearly identical arguments to these about natural history are being made at the same time in the United States before the Civil War. The first professor of natural history at Yale was Benjamin Selman, a very devout evangelical, who was appointed to that job by the missionary-minded president of Yale, Timothy White, who's very famous in church history. He wanted to talk about it, and Silliman was about it. And Silliman didn't believe that the earth was a few thousand years old. Well, that was just a dead issue. There's just, you can't argue that, he thought. He thought you had to agree the earth is really old. How old? Nobody knew for sure, but a heck of a lot older than human history. That's, he just thought for him and for the other people learning these geologies at the time, that was just not negotiable for them. It was as factual as to say that you're sitting here in this auditorium right now. Just, they weren't going to go there. They, 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 they accepted it as a truth. And so how do, you, how do you relate that to the Bible? Well, he did that in a series of uh, uh, lectures he gave that were published at the time. And he says this. He says, he laments that the, the relation of geology to sacred history, that is to the Bible, is now as little understood by many theologians and biblical critics as astronomy was at the time of Galileo. He thinks there's only one remedy for this. He says theologians must study geology. Or if they will not, or from, if they will not, or from peculiar circumstances cannot do it, they must be satisfied to receive its demonstrated truths from those who in the most effectual way. They will then be convinced that geology is not an enemy, but as it's an ally of revealed religion. He goes on to make a long argument about that, but I'll spare you. But his own study of nature's deep recesses led Silliman to interpret the six days of creation as long periods of geological time, culminating in the separate creation of human beings a few thousand years ago. He was probably the first American author to call that scheme progressive creation. The term was still fine. I don't think a single contemporary author who uses that term realizes that Silliman was using it as early as 1829. But that's what he was doing. Okay? I'm going to skip the details of this scheme here because I'm running a little bit out of time. And I'm going to skip what I was going to say about um, Galileo here. And I want to move a little further on. And um, uh, cut down to a section where I'm going to introduce the evolution issue. So let me do that. Since the 1960s, as you may know, many conservative Protestants have rejected the notion of an ancient earth. 
and have rejected the notion that the book of nature should inform our interpretation of the book of scripture. That classical scheme that Galileo and all these other people are using, even that Calvin had used, they're rejecting that scheme. Because they believe that the book of nature is much harder to read reliably than the book of scripture. They reverse, they're turning Galileo on his hand, okay? And I'm gonna come back to that shortly. But other approaches have also been favored by Christians who accept evolution. Starting with the first American evolutionist in a Darwinian sense. That was a botanist at Harvard named Asa Gray, who you see here. Asa Gray gave an address about this to, student, to divinity students at Yale in 1880. And he, 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 he said this. He said that at one time it was, it was common for people to try to relate Genesis closely to geology. And he says to bring the details of the two into agreement by extraneous suppositions and forced constructions of language, such as would now offend our critical sense. The most that is now intelligently claimed is that the teachings of the two, properly understood, are not incompatible. That's how he goes. So he's kind of backing away from this more aggressive, close reading of the two texts together. So how, what's his approach then? Well, for Gray, ideas like those ones I showed you about natural history earlier are based upon a faulty view of Genesis itself. Despite their efforts to say, like Galileo, that the Bible is not a science book, they had actually continued to treat it as if it were. They were anxiously showing how details of geology supported the words of scripture. That's in the section I, I skipped briefly, you need to skip that. Instead, Gray took a more higher approach, a sort of look down from a higher altitude approach, rather than getting down and dirty in the details. According to Gray, the Bible teaches truths of a totally different, wholly different nature than the truths of science. So that it's impossible to confirm Christianity or disconfirm it by appealing to science alone. As Gray says, I accept Christianity on its own evidence. And I'm yet to learn how science conflicts with it any more than it conflicts with simple theism, simple believing in God. He says, I take it that religion, and here he means Christianity, I take it that religion is based on the idea of a divine mind revealing himself to intelligent creatures for moral ends. Okay, I think you know what he's talking about, right? He's talking about the incarnation. He's talking about God directly showing himself to us and to give us moral instructions. Because that's what Christianity is about. That's what it is. It is this. He says, Revelation culminated in the advent of a divine person, who being made man, manifested the divine nature in union with the human. And this manifestation, who is, who is this manifestation? Who is it? It's Jesus. This manifestation constitutes Christianity. That's what Gray says. For Gray, the incarnation is the crowning miracle, he says. Attended by other miracles, he also says. In this way, Gray was able to affirm his acceptance of Darwin, of Darwin and evolution alongside his Christian faith. And even a very traditional faith, where he says himself, the, what he asks himself, what are the essential contents of that faith? He says they're briefly summed up in the Apostles and Nicene Creed. So he's a, he's a classic Orthodox small old Christian. He's not some whacked out liberal person who doesn't believe in the divinity of Jesus or the resurrection. He still says no Christian. He's a traditional Christian, and he believes that Darwin doesn't challenge any of that. Well, today, uh, like Gray, the modern Canadian evangelical scholar Dennis Lamoureux embraces evolution as God's way of creating and rejects efforts to harmonize Genesis with modern natural history. He doesn't think when you get down and dirty that it's intended to do that. Like Galileo, he affirms both the inerrancy of the Bible and accommodation. And he's fully aware of his debt to Galileo. In his view, when Genesis speaks about God separately creating plants and animals, each after their kind, this was simply conveying what he calls ancient science, that is the way they understood things at the time, which can't be mapped onto modern science. 
Now, that's, how he, that's where he's coming at this. He says that the Holy Spirit used the biology of the dead, meaning of the ancient world, as an incidental vessel to reveal an errant spiritual truth in Genesis 1. That's how he approaches it. Now, so far, Lamoureux's ideas have not been very well received among North American evangelicals. But the connections with the tradition stemming from Galileo are transparently clear. And perhaps they will gain a larger audience over time. I have no idea. Rejection of evolution, however, is a much more common stance among evangelicals and other conservative Protestants today. Indeed, since the 1960s, many lay Christians have embraced younger creationism a view that had been almost entirely abandoned by Protestant leaders around the time of the Civil War. That's a separate fact, I can talk, that's a historical fact. I can talk about that afterwards if you want, but I'm not going to explain that here right now. So, interesting question. What do young earth creationists think of Galileo's approach? Well, first, first, I ought to say that a tiny number of contemporary creationists, if your tiny means tiny, have turned the clock back 400 years by rejecting Copernican astronomy, that is, by rejecting the idea of the solar system. That's not mainstream creation, but it's out there. For example, Catholic culture warrior Robert Sungenis even operates a website called Galileo is Wrong, where he sells a two-volume book of the same name. In his view, the Catholic Church should never have forgiven Galileo, as Pope John Paul II did in 1992. For him, the earth really doesn't move. And Sun Genesis will sell you the resources you need to persuade others of that great deception. Around 1980, however, an engineer from Pittsburgh, Richard Elmendorf, a Protestant, circulated a handbill challenging the idea that the earth moves, offering to pay a thousand bucks to the first person, this is quoting his thing, to the first person, group, or organization to furnish documented scientific proof that the earth rotates on its axis daily and travels in orbit around the sun and And he lists a whole bunch of phenomena from astronomical textbooks or physics books that would be used today as evidence that this is the case. He says none of this counts. Um, uh, he, he, he thinks that it comes down to a choice between arbitrary philosophical assumption or faith-accepted revelation. And he says he wants it to be acknowledged as such and not misrepresented as if it were scientifically false settled. Herodotus Bauer, a former atheist turned Protestant fundamentalist, who earned a doctorate in astronomy at Case Western, provides the main theoretical basis for modern geocentrism. It's, he's once been, he's, his books have been described, I think accurately, as the most sophisticated defenses of geocentrism ever published. And there were a number of sophisticated defenses published in Galileo today. Since about 2000, the year 2000, Bao's book, The Geocentricity Primer, has been mailed unsolicited to more than 130,000 churches, including tens of thousands of Catholic and mainline churches, though, separate, though apparently with minimal effect. According to Bao, the fundamental hermeneutical issue is the inerrancy of scripture, especially in light of what he regards as the fickle pronouncements of science. For him, the authority of the Bible in all realms, including science, is at stake. How does he, ex how does he exposit Joshua 10, 12, 10, 12 to 14, the passage about standing in the earth still? Here's what he does. He says, the Bible says the sun stood still and the moon stayed. And since God cannot lie, this point of view must be true. That's what Paul says. Bao flatly rejects Galileo's argument that God sometimes speaks anthropocentrically or phenomenologically. Bao says, either the sun stood still or the earth stood still. Either God inerrantly inspired the wording or he did not. Either the Bible is trustworthy or it is not. There is no middle ground. There is no room for compromise. After all, both the anthropocentric theory of inspiration and the phenomenal language theory are forms of accommodation. And he puts that word in italics and he hates the word. He says, where God is said to accommodate his wording to the understanding of the common man. 
good though that may sound on the surface, accommodation still maintains that God goes along with the accepted story, even though he does not really believe the story. That is, even though God does not really believe the story. That's how Bao puts it. So Bao finds accommodation wholly unacceptable in any form. Not even Calvin escapes Bao's disapproval, even though Bao is actually pretty Calvinistic in the way he thinks in many ways. And he says, Calvin appealed to accommodation in his biblical commentaries, and Bao says, if Calvin were alive today, he would probably be a heliocentric, theistic evolutionist. That's what Bao says. He ends up endorsing an updated version of the cosmology of the 16th century, Lutheran astronomer Tico Brahe, according to which the Earth stands still in the center, the sun, and, and the, the sun goes around the Earth, and the other planets go around the sun, therefore are carried around the Earth, and the stars are all together at the edge of the world. That's what, there's even a, a Tico's bookshop where you can go and find these things to help you understand this. <coughs> That, that Bao's group operates. Now, most creationists, to be frank, think the geocentrists are barking up the wrong tree. But they also have serious problems with Galileo when the context is not Copernicus. Astronomer Danny Faulkner expressly rejects any relevant parallel between Galileo and evolutionists. <coughs> he says, many evolutionists claim that disbelief in evolution is like disbelief that the Earth goes around the sun. The obvious flaw is that the latter, and the latter he means Copernicus, right? Moving around the sun. The latter is repeatable and observable, while the former, meaning the history of the Earth, is not. <coughs> Implicit here is the premise that the historical sciences, including evolution, that is the ones that deal with the past, okay? Historical, are less legitimate than the experimental sciences, which you can do right now because they purport to explain unwitnessed and unrepeatable events. Since the Bible contains the testimony of the only witness to creation, the only eyewitness, God, its literal sense must always take precedence over the merely hypothetical, the merely speculative scenarios imagined by scientists. Creationists typically refer to creationism as origins science, in which the primary authority is given to scripture in contrast to operation science, or observational science, in which the assured results of current observations and experiments are allowed to influence the interpretation of scripture. There, it's allowed, it's not in the other case. This distinction underlies the rejection of the notion that one ought to consider the book of nature when interpreting the book of scripture, the very model employed by Galileo and so many others since his time. Well, why reject that model? This is, this is really my final point. Why reject that model? Listen to the words of theologian John C. Whitcomb, Jr., who was the co-author with Henry Morris, with the late Henry Morris, of the Genesis Flood, the book published in 1961 that launched modern creationism. According to Whitcomb, Galileo's model that he calls the double revelation theory, the book of nature, Scripture, both revealed, okay, the double revelation theory. That model, he says, fails to give due recognition to the tremendous limitations which inhibit the scientific method when applied to the study of origins. That's what he says. He says it overlooks the insuperable scientific problems which continue to plague all naturalistic and evolutionary concerning the origin of the material universe and of living things, while at the same time, in his view, underestimates God's special revelation in scripture. My final example comes from Terry Mortensen, an historian of science who works for Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis. Mortensen's approach is precisely the opposite of Galileo. Read this carefully as it comes in front of you, Pay attention to every adjective. Here's what Mortensen says. The Bible is the propositional re verbal revelation of God. But the creation is the more difficult to interpret nonverbal revelation about God. Therefore, 
it is methodologically mistaken to use fallen men's interpretations of the cursed creation to, to reinterpret God's plain, inherent word, to make it fit sinful men's fallible theories about the unobserved past. It's hard to imagine putting it more succinctly, this it? Mortensen believes that opponents of creationism go too far when they enlist Galileo on their behalf. Galileo's situation, he says, was focused exclusively on the present structure and operation of the universe, rather than on how it came into being and attained its present arrangement. In his opinion, scientific explanations about the origin and history of the Earth must be differentiated from scientific explanations about the present state and operation of the creation. Those are his words. While that latter stuff, present stuff, is fully scientific, the former is far too speculative and not genuinely scientific. So how then, to return to my title, how then do creationists keep Galileo out of the Garden of Eden? Although most creationists accept Galileo's claims about the presence of phenomenal language in some parts of scripture, they reject the larger conceptual framework, framework of ideas, upon which Galileo grounded those, uh, those claims about the Bible. They do not believe that the historical sciences, the ones studying the past of the earth, are worthy of the name science, and they completely reverse Galileo's overall attitude. The book of nature must never take precedence over the book of scripture when it comes to understanding the origin of things. Thanks for your attention to those. So we're going to give you a, I'm sure, much needed break. Uh, you had to, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll all be available for some question and answer time here. Um, one of the things, as we do it, and I won't talk for more than about 20 seconds, um, that, uh, that's interesting in this is to look back at, at, at the, the history and the tradition of our, even our seminary, uh, the B.B. Warfield classroom of the of Knox Theological Seminary was named after the person who is predominantly given credit for the view of inerrancy that is the one that Knox sits firmly in tradition with in modern evangelicalism. And B.B. Warfield was one of those people for whom, uh, in that predating the modern controversy, one of those people for whom the evidence was so clear that as the inheritance, he was also quite sympathetic both to the uh, older age of the earth and to the evolution. So as we have the discussion, which is not about any of that, we have the discussion in the framework of being people in that tradition of Augustine and of Calvin and of people like B.B. Warfield and Charles Hodge who were engaging with hard questions and you can certainly think coming up with wrong answers but we will be trying to go through the process of anticipating what do we have to engage next. And so the first one of those is going to be coming up here very shortly. Let's take a coffee break. We'll be available for any question and answers. And we're going to see the what's coming next, what in the world are we going to do about it.
Starting, we'll be restarting in about two minutes. I'm going to introduce my wife, Lindsay, so uh, when I go up, this will, I don't have to test it or anything. I can just start talking. Okay. Gotcha. What's up? Good. Do you have an extra pen? Can you check for me? You want? I'll ask the lawyer. <laughs> 
As we, uh, as we begin the next segment, I'd like to call your attention to something. If you look in your, uh, in your program, you'll see that we have a question and answer time that's later on in the schedule. In order to make that work as well as possible, you can send in questions, and we've got somebody who will be collecting those, and then they'll give them to the speakers at the end. So the text, the phone number is up there, 772-200-1338. If you'd like to submit questions for question and answer, the question and answer session is going to relate to our three back and forth sessions that we've got. So just for those, the next three sessions. So for the question and answer, once again, 772, and by the way, online also, you guys can do it. 772-200-1338. And since I see it all the time out there, I probably need to say it. Charges may apply, right? It's a regular old text message phone number. So I, um, it would be a normal text message. So if you've got any questions that come up during these next three sessions, please feel free to send those in. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Josh Bruce, who's going to be doing our next introduction. I'm not even the speaker. That's awesome. <laughs> um, well, it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker today, uh, Dr. Lindsay Bruce. Um, some of you may have met me before, but I'm a uh, professor at Knox Theological Seminary. Uh, my name is Josh Bruce, and you may notice there's a similarity between our last names. Um, I want to assure you there's no bias in what I'm about to say about our next speaker in terms of an introduction. Uh, in fact, to make sure I'm not biased, I actually brought up her official biography. Uh, so I can make sure to do a good job of this. According to Dr. Lindsay Bruce's official biography, she has a PhD in integrative biology focused on oxidative stress and its effect on neurodegeneration and aging. I practiced saying that five times before getting up here. Her research has been published in a number of very distinguished scientific journals, and she has presented on topics as varied as gut microbiome, aging, and best practices for teaching science in the classroom. The one thing that I will say that you won't find on her official biography, and it's the reason I feel most privileged to introduce her today, is that our next speaker, Dr. Bruce, is the very best person I know. And that's because she spends every day changing lives, mine included. So join me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Lindsay Bruce. Um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Lindsay Bruce, uh, and I teach biology across the street at Westminster Academy. Uh, so I'm going to first have a shout out to all my students who are in the audience today and my fellow science department teachers. Um, my research background is in genomic manipulation of Drosophila, or fruit flies. Um, and I used the uh, transposon-based genetic uh, genomic manipulation uh, system to modify oxidative stress-related enzymes in the fruit fly and see its effects on aging and neurodegeneration. Uh, so I love all things genetics, and I'm really excited today to delve into the future of genomic manipulation in humans. So I'd like to start out with a story, one you may actually be familiar with because it made headline news. Uh, it sounds like something out of a science fiction novel, and yet it is the world we live in today. On November 25th, 2018, Chinese scientist He Zhengkai stunned the scientific world when he announced on a YouTube video the birth of twin girls that had been genetically modified by his lab as embryos. Two days later, He, he presented his research at the Second International Summit on Human Genome Editing in Hong Kong. The twins, named Lulu and Nana, were born to a healthy mother and an HIV-positive father. The gene selected for editing was the CCR5 gene, which codes for a protein that allows HIV to infect cells. The idea was to create children that were immune to acquiring HIV, especially as these particular children had a slightly increased risk of acquiring the disease compared with children from two healthy parents. 
The backlash to this announcement was swift. He's presentation in Hong Kong was crowded with skeptical scientists, scientists voicing their concerns. First of all, that it was unnecessary. Why was it necessary to resort to germline <coughs> modification, which is modification of egg and sperm cells, to prevent acquisition of HIV, when the chance of acquiring the disease was so minimal to begin with, even in the case of the twin girls? Secondly, that it was unethical. Why did He ignore the global community's firm stance on extreme caution prior to human germline editing? He's method was not 100% accurate and could potentially edit other genes prior, uh, besides the targeted gene. He has insisted that neither girl has off-target mutations, but as his work has not been published or peer-reviewed in a scientific journal, it is hard to accurately analyze that claim. Off-target edits created somewhere else in the baby's genome could lead to cancer or another genetic disorder. Also that it was impractical. Why did he uh, inactivate the CCR5 gene when ba the babies could theoretically still acquire HIV through another gene, the CXCR4 gene? While the girls may be less likely to acquire HIV if the procedure worked perfectly, they would not be completely immune. And finally, the unknown. What ramifications would this have for the lives of the baby girls? And what ramifications would it have for any potential future offspring of the twins? Because all of the girls' cells were, genetic, were in theory genetically modified, the modifications should in turn pass down to any offspring they may have. He could very well have made healthy babies sick and caused their offspring to have the disease as well. The work was quickly denounced by the conference organizing committee, followed by condemnations from the US, the UK, Chinese, and other governmental leading scientific organizations. Leading scientists such as Jennifer Doudna, the co-discoverer of the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing tool, which was used to modify the twins' genome, also publicized their concerns. And then the situation got even crazier. He returned to China and disappeared as in no one knew where he was. The watching world was left with many questions. What had happened to He Zhengkai? And what about the health and well-being of the world's first ever germline edited human? So let's take a step back from this saga for a moment and ask a question. What is gene editing anyway? To answer that question, we must start with our genomes. Our genomes consist of all the DNA in our cells. You probably recognize DNA in this picture in all its double helix glory. DNA gives instructions for making proteins, which carry out a huge number of functions in our bodies. Proteins act as structures, like the actin and myosin filaments seen here that make up our muscles. Proteins act as transport molecules, like hemoglobin, which carries oxygen around to our bodies and our red blood cells. Proteins act as enzymes, like the enzyme catalase, which breaks down harmful hydrogen peroxide in our body into non-harmful water and oxygen. You've actually probably seen catalase at work before and might not have even known. Um, if you've ever had a cut and washed it out with hydrogen peroxide, you'll have noticed that it bubbles. That bubbling is the result of the catalase in your body decomposing the hydrogen peroxide that you poured on it and releasing oxygen. Your DNA is packaged into chromosomes, and you get half your chromosomes from your dad, pictured here in blue, and half your chromosomes from your mom, pictured here in pink. And the process of, of uh, handing down chromosomes from parent to offspring works very well. However, genetic diseases, like cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, and sickle cell anemia can be passed from parents who are carriers of a disease to the offspring. In other cases, random mutations, changes to the <coughs> DNA code, can occur and cause a genetic disorder when neither parent was a carrier. While there are treatment options for genetic diseases, there are no cures. Scientists have been searching for a cure to genomic diseases through genome modification for some time now. Initially, scientists used gene therapy, 
Gene therapy uses an inactivated virus, like the common cold virus, to deliver a healthy copy of a gene to a patient with a mutated copy. It doesn't correct the mutation. It simply provides a good copy alongside the mutated copy. In the blue diagram here, you can see the viral vector, in this case, the adenovirus. And it contains a new gene, shown in pink, that has been modified and placed inside the viral vector. The viral vector then directs the gene to the nucleus of the cell where the other DNA is and the uh, protein making machinery uh, is uh, so that the cell can take the DNA and turn it into a, a new protein to help the cell. The first time that gene therapy was used was in 1990 in a four-year-old uh, patient, a four-year-old girl who had uh, adenosine deaminase, a disease, disease that left her without an immune system. And so this therapy was used in this patient very successfully and in other patients following her, and she was able to be, uh, at least some of her symptoms were alleviated from this uh, particular disease. However, in 1999, 18-year-old patient Jesse Gelsinger, pictured here, volunteered for an ornithine transcarbamylase, OTC deficiency, gene therapy trial. Jesse had the mild version of the disease, but it was controlled through diet and medication. He volunteered for this trial, trying to help the patients, the babies who were born with a very severe version of this disease and would die in infancy. However, Jesse had a massive reaction to the viral vector that was used and died. Immediately, all such gene therapy trials halted. Gene editing is slightly different than gene therapy. Instead of simply giving good copies of a gene to a patient with mutated copies of a gene, gene editing has the potential to repair the mutation within the person's genome. The first types of gene editing molecules that were discovered are known as zinc finger nucleases. They're, fig they're pictured here under the letter A. They were first discovered in 1985 and first used to edit the genome of mice in a mouse cancer therapy trial in 1994. But zinc finger nucleases were expensive, time consuming to make, and had a very low efficiency. That is, they didn't work all that well. The next gene editing complex to be discovered, transcription activator-like effector-based nucleases, or talons, is pictured here under the letter B. Talons were found in 2007 and first put to use editing the genome of crickets in 2012. But while the efficiency of talons was much higher compared to the efficiency of the zinc-fingered nucleases, they were still time-consuming and expensive to create. And they were quickly overshadowed by our last genome editing complex, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR, pictured here under the letter C, and a story about cheese. Yes, I meant actual cheese, and my apologies for mentioning cheese this close to lunch, but please bear with me. Dr. Sylvain Moyneau and his lab at Laravel University in Quebec was performing research on the cheese-making bacteria Streptococcus thermophilus. The problem was that this bacterial strain kept getting infected with a virus. Those yellow spider-like creatures you see on the bottom right corner picture, those are bacterial viruses. Fun fact, bacteria can get sick with viruses just like you and I can get sick with viruses. <coughs> and when your cheese bacteria gets sick with a virus and dies, the milk never becomes cheese and the world mourns. <laughs> but just like humans, bacteria also have immune systems that allow them to fight off certain viruses. And Moineau and his colleagues noticed that some bacteria were better off at fighting the, the viruses versus other bacteria. And this was because of the bacterial defense system, which, was, which we now know to be the famous CRISPR complex. Other scientists working for Danisco's food production company, or DuPont's food, food production company, Danisco, continued to build upon this discovery. So Rodolphe Barango and Philippe Horvath discovered that CRISPR worked by actually keeping a piece of the viral DNA in its own genome, kind of like a red flag and almost like a vaccine works. 
It uses it to identify if it gets reinfected with the virus. I've already seen this virus, and I need to destroy it. It sends out the CRISPR machinery to immediately destroy the virus. Now, it's quite a long way from bacterial defense system to curing human genomic diseases. And that's where two researchers, researchers Emmanuel Charpentier, and who is now at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, and Jennifer Doudna of the University of California, Berkeley, come into the story. Charpentier showed how RNA molecules lead CRISPR to a specific section of DNA. And then Charpentier and Doudna collaborated to show how Cas9, which is CRISPR-associated protein number 9, cuts the DNA at a particular section, and how this could be used to actually modify DNA in a living organism. George, George Church of Harvard and Feng Zhang of the Broad Institute, MIT, showed that the system could be successfully used in human cells as well. This diagram shows an overview of how the system could repair DNA. The Cas9 protein is seen here as a white cloud, and the guide RNA is seen in purple. They form a complex. The guide RNA then takes the Cas9 to a specific segment of DNA, where Cas9 then cuts the DNA completely through. At that point in time, the DNA is, av is available to be programmed, and you can put in a pre-programmed or a, a newly modified piece of DNA into the DNA at that section. This sequence of events is easier to grasp visually, so I'm going to play this short clip animating the process for you. Oops. Chris, I don't know what I did. Can you help me out? Can you play that for me since I obviously my play did not work? We could just move on. Okay. Okay. So, um, my apologies, but. You'll have to take my word for it that the, there are a, there's a Mayo Clinic clip out there that shows uh, how the process works. It has a little animation that uh, goes along with what I told you. Uh, so CAS, CRISPR-Cas9 research spread like wildfire. In 2012, when Charpentier and Doudna published their findings, there were only 126 papers published that entire year from all researchers on CRISPR. But last year, there were over 5,000. Clinical trials using CRISPR-Cas9 are gradually starting to pop up. Most, the most encouraging of these types of trials are, are treating blood diseases, like sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia. In the sickle cell anemia trial, which is pictured here, the only patient who has been treated so far is Victoria Gray, who is a mom of four and has been suffering de debilitating pain attacks since she was young. Sickle cell anemia causes blood cells, which should be round, as seen in the picture to the right, to become sickle-shaped. The sickle-shaped blood cells don't move well through blood vessels and get caught in blood vessels and in joints, and this leads to pain, swelling, inflammation, and other symptoms. Last year, Dr. Hader, Hader Frangel of the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Tennessee removed Miss Gray's bone marrow, corrected the deficiency in her blood cells using CRISPR-Cas9, and then reinserted those blood cells into her bone marrow again. Less than a year later, her blood is making fetal hemoglobin, the protein that she was once lacking. And incredibly, Miss Gray has not suffered a debilitating pain attack since her procedure. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania are using CRISPR to fight off cancer using a type of therapy called CAR T cell therapy. Blood is drawn from the patients, and T cells in the blood are weaponized into CAR T cells that target and fight cancer cells. 
It's your own cells that are going to fight the cancer for you. These cells are then multiplied and then re-injected into the patient. Now this type of treatment has been used before, prior to CRISPR, but in those clinical trials, the problem with it was the patients had a pretty good immune response to the modified CAR T cells. In this particular trial in multiple myeloma and sarcoma patients, the uh, patients exhibited no side effects to the CRISPR edited CAR T cells. Uh, however, the dosage is not quite right yet as it did not actually effectively treat the cancer. So further clinical trials are going to uh, continue to allow it to uh, halt and modify the progression of a specific cancer. There are quite a few biotech companies that are plunging forward with CRISPR-based advances. Editas Medicine is developing therapies for various genetic blindness diseases, such as Usher syndrome and Leber congenital amaurosis, or LCA. They have one clinical trial underway in LCA that involves both gene therapy, the one we discussed before, and gene editing. They use the viral vector to transport the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery to the correct cells in a person's eyes where the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery can correct those cells and restore sight. Now these types of, of trials are less uh, problematic than having a gene therapy throughout your entire body because your eye cells have very little immune response. And so the uh, likelihood of getting some sort of crazy reaction to this type of gene therapy is minimal. Another biotech company is CRISPR Therapeutics. This one was started by uh, Charpentier, the researcher that we discussed earlier. And it's looking at immune therapies for cancers, as well as they have a small beta thalassemia, a blood disorder trial, running in Germany. Mammoth Biosciences was started by Jennifer Doudna, and uh, she's using CRISPR-based products to allow doctors to rapidly diagnose genetic diseases, which previously has taken more time. Because this technology is inexpensive and accessible, there has been a whole new movement of do-it-yourself DIY bio that has exploded. These movements, as a scientist, I think are kind of neat. The goal is to open a lab space to the public. Then anyone can come in and take a class or use the tools and research and, and supplies that are available there to play around and do their own research. Uh, they use them to do uh, inventions of many different kinds, to take things apart, to rebuild things. They use them even to create bio art, which is uh, really interesting. This particular lab is called GenSpace, and it's in New York and led by a biologist, Ellen Jorgensen. But researchers, biotech companies, and DIY bio-open lab spaces are not the only people using CRISPR-Cas9. A whole new branch of scientific researchers has popped up using YouTube and home labs in their garages. The unofficial leader of this movement is Dr. Josiah Zayner, pictured here. He's a former NASA employee and a self-proclaimed biohacker, an owner of the biotech company Odin, which has the goal of making CRISPR-based technology accessible to the masses. Zayner conducted a CRISPR experiment on his own muscle in front of a live audience in 2017. He was also drinking scotch from a flask while he did it, so it was a crazy experiment. You can, you can view it online. The injection was meant to increase the size of the muscle cells that came in contact with the injection, uh, but it seems to have only resulted in some amount of redness and swelling. Zayner admits he did not expect it to work, but he did want, he did want to do it as a bit of a publicity stunt, stunt uh, to draw attention to the technology. One of Zayner's acolytes, Mississippi dog breeder David Aishi, has bought supplies from Zayner and eventually uh, and created this lab in his backyard with the hopes of both creating dogs that can glow in the dark using jellyfish protein, uh, and also curing Dalmatians of genetic diseases that have plagued them due to inbreeding. While the US government is starting to put restrictions in place on these types of procedures and practices, the supplies are readily available, and people are taking advantage of it, trained researcher or not. Another way that gene therapy and editing is being used is as biotourism. So Liz Parrish has announced that she would like to live forever. So she traveled to Latin America to have an undisclosed company provide her with anti-aging gene therapy 
which has also not disclosed the nature of the gene therapy injections, but has hinted that they involve the enzyme telomerase, which is involved in lengthening the ends of your chromosomes, which eventually shorten as we age. The problem, of course, with this being that it's a very risky endeavor as cancer cells also are able to lengthen their own uh, telomeres at the end of their chromosomes. She started her own biotech company devoted to anti-aging called BioViva. Brian Hanley is a professor at Auburn, Auburn University, and he runs a company that wants tourists to come to him, to the US, for gene therapy treatments, anti-aging gene therapy treatments. Uh, he managed to get his own treatment here in the US. Uh, and he did this by getting a local ethics board to sign off on the treatments and enlisting the help of a, a plastic surgeon to give him the gene therapy injections. It's likely that other people are also trying these treatments too, just behind closed doors to attract less scrutiny. And while currently risky, the technology is there to create designer children. We are on the verge of wealthy parents paying for the child they want to have. If Felicity Huffman and Lori Laughlin are willing to pay vast sums for an SAT score, how much would they pay for a genetically engineered child who is able to take the SAT and score a perfect score on their own? <laughs> All this brings us back to Lulu and Nana, the genetically modified Chinese baby girls, and the scientist behind it, He Zheng Pai. After nearly a year of seclusion, it turns out that he was being kept under house arrest by the Chinese government. He is pictured here on the balcony of his apartment during his house arrest. He was sentenced to three years of prison time and a close to half a million dollar fine, but the punishment feels almost mandated by the public worldwide outcry. China has no laws against human gene editing and despite the messiness of this situation does not appear to be moving towards any restrictive legislation on this front. There has been no news on Lulu and Nana, the now one-year-old girls who have genetically, were genetically ma manipulated. Some fantastical reports have indicated that they have above average intelligence, and others have indicated that they may have a shortened lifespan due to the modification. But both reports have been decried by the majority of scientists as premature. Gene editing may, in fact, have no effect on the girls. And given the lack of credible news on them, we may actually ever never know if it does. Like it or not, gene editing is here to stay. CRISPR-Cas9 has paved the way for a whole new realm of technological advances on that front. And the experimentation continues onward, regulated, unregulated, constrained by ethical guidelines, or ignored by government officials, unless it causes too much of a stir, in pristine laboratories, or in your own <coughs> garage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bruce, for uh, that very informative presentation. Um, it's kind of a hard act to follow. Let me just say at the outset that um, in many ways, I am the worst person in the whole entire world to give a response on science. And to just explain this to you a little bit, let me, let me tell you what I did when they asked me to give this response. I Googled the word gene. Now, uh, Google initially thought that I was looking for the proper name gene, <laughs> short for Eugene. Um, so it told me that the name is of English origin. It means well-born, um, but that didn't help at all. So I was a little stuck. For those of you who are listening to all of this and maybe find yourselves a little confused at points, you're in good company. You're in my company, so company. <laughs> As a few of you will know, perhaps, I teach at Knox, and my background is in church history and in classics rather than in science. So like many of you, I am not going to have a PhD in science, and I have almost no background in science whatsoever. Science scared me as a kid for reasons that were brought home as I sat here and listened to this. It sounded like a brave new world, and it kind of still does. Um, I suspect that many of us here today are asking certain questions as we hear this kind of presentation when it comes to the editing of genes. Most of the time, I think, when people like you or me uh, are, are hearing these kinds of talks, we're not so much asking technical questions, although some of the technical details may be a bit 
over our head, um, but I think we're, we're usually asking more spiritual questions, moral questions. So we're asking things like, not how do we do this, but should we do this? Is it moral? Is this consistent with what we believe, and many of us here are Christians, about what it means to be human? What it means to be created in the image of God? So Dr. Bruce, on behalf of our audience, if you don't mind, I, I wanted to ask you a few questions here about all of this that come from the, from the perspective of someone like me who's in a ministry context rather than a science lab, or it turns out a neighborhood garage, I guess, if you're doing gene editing. Hopefully, um, these questions can at least begin a very important conversation that I think we should have about a very important issue. I would uh, encourage you, as Dr. Sansbury encouraged you, to write down questions as well of your own, uh, because you will have a chance later on today to ask those. So if it's okay with Dr. Bruce, I'll go ahead and ask three questions. I should mention to you all that these three questions are written down, so I'm going to read them, uh, but Dr. Bruce has not seen them at this point. That was not strategic. Uh, I used to be a trial attorney. I'm not, I'm not pulling a fast one. Uh, Dr. Bruce and I are married, and we have two little children, so what that means is we don't talk. Um, <laughs> until today, actually, so thank you all <laughs> for this opportunity. We get a chance to chat. Should do this again. <laughs> Here are the three main theological and pastoral questions that came to mind as I reviewed Dr. Bruce's talk. The first one is one that I suspect many of us were kind of wondering as we sat here today, and it's this question, are we playing God? Isn't the sort of research that Dr. Bruce has told us about flowing out of a sinful kind of pride? The arrogance that assumes that we can know as much as God, and actually maybe we can know better than he does. Shouldn't a Christian response to this sort of technology be a humble acceptance of our place in God's good and created order. And I suspect that at least some of you were wondering that as well. Peter Bruegel's magnificent Tower of Babel came to mind as I wrote this down, and you'll see it up on the screen there. And I sometimes wonder if our genetic scientists these days aren't just modern versions of Nimrod and company scaling heaven to overthrow God. The fact that they wear lab coats probably causes us more concern rather than less. I mentioned earlier that I have some background in classics, and I'll tell you from that background that you don't have to be a Christian to share some of these concerns. Even going all the way back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, they all had stories about what could happen if we exceeded the bounds of our human knowledge. They have warnings about the dangers of pride. Think of the stories of Pandora's box or the story of Icarus. If you know those stories, you know what I'm talking about. The penalties that we pay for flying too close to the sun. So here's my question to Dr. Bruce. Do scientists in this field share that kind of concern at all? And I'll make one caveat as I ask you that question. Please do not tell me in your answer, I beg you, that if I like taking aspirin for a headache or prefer Novocaine when I'm having my teeth drilled, that I should also support genetic engineering. They don't feel the same to me. My second concern is focused on the equities, or perhaps I should say the inequities of all of this. As Christians, and especially as Christian leaders, as many of you will be in, in different ministries, we all are called by scripture to care for the powerless, the poor, the widow, the orphan. The Bible just doesn't leave us any choice on that. But let's be honest and let's admit it. If scientists are being honest to us, wouldn't they have to tell us that, especially with respect to the modification of embryos, the people who are going to be able to, avoid, to, to afford this kind of treatment are going to be first and foremost the richest among us, though can, those who can afford to pay large sums. The SAT cheating scandal that you mentioned, Dr. Bruce, is just one recent example of the lengths that so many wealthy parents will go to secure the very best opportunities for their own children, even at the expense of so many others. Personally, and I hate to be too dramatic about it, but I, I dread a future dystopian Lake Wobegon. You all know Lake Wobegon? Where all the rich women are strong, all the rich men are good looking, and all their rich little brats above average. <laughs> I fear it. 
Now, Dr. Bruce, you and I have two fine little geniuses of our own who I'm sure will hold their own against their genetically enhanced peers, but I fear for our grandchildren. How are they going to get into Harvard if they're competing against seven-foot-tall NBA athletes who were also born with a genetic predisposition to understand Hegel? I have to say, even as I'm saying it, it does sound pretty cool. <laughs> More seriously, though, does a future in which our wealthy parents shop for blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Nordic athletic geniuses bother you? Does it bother other scientists? I've been told, of course, that the minute you bring the Nazis into an argument, you've lost it. I've just done that, and I'm not even a little ashamed of it. It's what we're all thinking, right? Lastly, and this is a bit more of an open-ended question than my, my first two questions, what, if anything, Dr. Bruce, keeps genetic scientists up at night worrying about all of this? I suspect that there might be some real concerns that genetic scientists actually feel, but perhaps they're worried about sharing them with the rest of us for fear of, of panicking us. So I ask you, as I conclude these, these questions, to just give us maybe one or two of these sincere concerns that genetic scientists might actually have. And I say that so that we can be better informed, but also so that we can all get very upset stomachs before our lunch. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll do my best to take a shot at some of these uh, questions. Um, I also apparently need to remind the dentist never to give my husband Novocaine. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think the first question that I heard was, are scientists playing God? Um, I think that's a bit strong of a way of putting it. I, I think the fear that is being expressed in regards to this technology is kind of the same fear that has been expressed by almost every age in response to a new advance or a new technology. Um, and the simple fact is this, that like it or not, this technology is being implemented now, full stop. So it's hard to say that we should completely stop this because at least in some areas or um, you know, unregulated, unregulated scientists or, or unregulated areas of the world, that this is going to continue. And even in the US versions of this are, are going onward. So I think that we have to deal with the technology and have the conversation about the technology that we have that is, is being implemented now instead of, instead of having a, a kind of a fear mongering type uh, thing where this is scary and this could go wrong. With that said, I think that there are a lot of concerns that should be voiced in response to this and I think they are being voiced by the scientific community, by uh, bioethics uh, communities. Um, so I think that there is a lot of, of pushback on, on implementing this carefully and avoiding just willy-nilly trying to make ourselves some best version of, of ourselves that we could be. Um, so that was the first point I heard. The second point I heard was the, about the quality of it and um, the creation of designer babies. So I think there are kind of two categories of implementation of this, at least with, with regards to in enhancing ourselves. Uh, I think there's, there's kind of this level playing field where kind of a healthy person is. And most people, I think, don't have a problem with trying to carefully and cautiously move forward on helping those who have a genetic disease kind of come up to where everyone else is. So, so curing or alleviating suffering is generally seen as a positive use of, of this uh, technology. Um, the question is, if we take a normal human and then try to make them superhuman in some, some way, is that ethical and, and, and should it be ethical and how should that be, be regulated? Um, the, the biohackers that we see are, are trying to do this to themselves 
Um, and I think the government is starting to try and regulate that a little bit, but it's often been seen as if you want to try this on yourself, go ahead. But um, that we definitely need to have some serious conversations before anything like that. Taking a, a normal person and trying to enhance them is, is move forward. I think there, there's a lot more caution that needs to be taken with that particular use of the technology. Um, and I think the immediate inequality isn't going to be designer baby versus regular baby. Um, I think the immediate inequality may be affordability and access to treatment for patients with diseases because even now CRISPR or non-CRISPR based uh, medicines are sometimes so expensive that lower to middle income people don't have access to the uh, treatment, the ability to, to uh, treat their, their babies. Um, so it's kind of, I think as Christians, since we care about humans made in the image of God, that one of the things that we need to uh, be thinking about is how to equalize access to treatment um, so that it's not those who can afford to save their children's lives through this new groundbreaking treat treatment versus those who cannot afford to do this. Um, and then lastly, scientific concerns. Does the scientific community have concerns? They definitely are voicing uh, concerns. There's been, I mean, scientists, including uh, Jennifer Dowden, who I mentioned, have gone in front of the US government on panels and talked to ethics committees. Um, and there's a whole branch of bioethics that is trying to allow scientific communication, scientific dialogue, uh, so that it's not just ramrodding forward implementation of this without people knowing what's going on, but allowing people to actually see, OK, these are the possible uses. How do we want to use this? How do we want to move forward? Um, there are I mean, crazy ways in which this technology could be used that are concerning, that are scary. Uh, so I can think about like bioterrorism or bioweapons if you wanted to modify the bubonic plague virus, uh, so, or bacteria, not virus, um, to uh, be you know, somehow unable to stop by the current methods that we have you know, and use that as a, an agent of biowarfare. That, that's like crazy way in which this could be uh, taken. Um, I think the concerns on that front may be slightly overblown, um, just because if you have, God, there's so many, unfortunately, weapons that are available for destruction. That seems like a very long way around to get to the same point that other things can help you do. Um, there could be enthusiastic biohackers that where it goes wrong, and so we have problems with that. There was a biohacker last year that was found dead. They don't think it was a, related to his biohacking, but uh, the CEO of Ascendance Biomedical um, was uh, trying out all kinds of crazy things, um, but was probably uh, not biohacking related, but he was found dead probably due to ketamine, I think. Um, and I think scientists are mainly worried about germline edits. So edit, edits to sperm and egg cells because those are the edits that not only affect the person being that, that will be edited, but the future generations. And how that is passed down through the generations, I think it is something that we don't know yet. And it'll be, uh, I mean, eventually, I guess we'll see how that goes. But um, right now, the technology it, it is risky. I think um, one of the really interesting things that Lindsay talked about in this is it's not there. It's great to have the conversation about what should be done, but it's not just a conversation about what should be done. It is going to happen, and people are experimenting on themselves. And there's going to be very interesting questions for us in the church pastorally. What do we do when someone walks into the door who has been willfully attempting the effort of transhumanism, of becoming more than human, of becoming something other than human. What will we say and what will we do 
And how do we even think that through theologically when one of the main traditions of the church with respect to what Christ did is taking on humanity? What happens when someone has willfully chosen to try not to be a human? So there are some really interesting questions that are going to come, and we don't know how it will go. We don't know what the shape will be. When I was in seminary, we were supposed to have clones walking into our churches all the time by now. It hasn't happened, but it is still a strange world. It was also supposed to be very hard. I remember gene editing, and the statements were, it's very hard, it's very expensive, and we haven't been able to do it well, and now you can buy a kit online. So the world is already strangely different than what I was trained to anticipate. Unfortunately, it is 20 years ago, but it doesn't seem like that long that I was getting trained on that. So here's where we are right now. We've got an hour break for lunch to let everybody go. If you're, if you're traveling in, there's plenty of options close by, right across the street. We're going to restart at 1 o'clock. We have two more of these style presentations uh, with issues, in one case, in neuroscience and the, uh, the question of consciousness and what, the, what, the, what looking at the brain and, and looking at how the brain functions is explaining about who we are. Um, we're all, we also have one on questions of ecology, which is also very interesting. I've tried to write on this before, and the ethics of Christianity aren't really directed at what to do when something is fine person by person but not fine at all when everyone's doing it. And so there are places where it's hard to take the Christian ethical system and apply it to all of these pieces. And so we're going to look at two uh, questions coming from those areas. Then, as I say, we have the question and answer time period, so you can text those questions in if you have them. It's still up there, 772-200-1338. We won't be doing live questions. The only questions we'll be going through are the ones that are sent in. Uh, we'll have that question and answer session, and then we'll have the, uh, the, the completion of the day. So uh, we'll see you in an hour. We'll be starting promptly at 1 o'clock. Thank <laughs> you.